Hi, my name is Emily White and I'm here to present on equipment that can be useful for kids in phys ed and sport um, for children who have low vision or who are blind. Um, this equipment is mainly aimed at kids in primary settings but can be useful for some kids in secondary settings and certainly in special school settings as well. What we'll do is we'll look at a range of equipment that has been either bought or modified and we'll talk about which ways you can modify current existing equipment or where you can purchase some of these more specialized pieces. In some cases the equipment has been bought from $2 shops which is quite a nice way to save on some money. Um, we'll go through a range of different types of equipment like balls and eye hand or in some cases ear hand coordination skills, um, gross motor, some sport based activities and then actually leading up into sport activities such as tennis, goal ball, um, blind cricket and so forth. Alright, so our first section we're going to talk about is mainstream sport equipment and this is for students with vision impairments to learn and practice the skills of mainstream sports and in some cases play a disability friendly version of that sport. So we'll start with basketball, which is quite a big favorite. This is a bell basketball. There's not a lot of sound to it, but some kids do prefer using them, otherwise it's a regulation basketball. This is a bell soccer ball or a rattle soccer ball. It's got a much clearer sound. Um, and otherwise it's a regulation ball. You can get them in different sizes, size 5, size 6, um, and there's also a futsal version of these as well. Not all kids will like to play with a bell ball because it might make them feel very different, or in some cases they don't find the sound very useful at all. So for some kids a good high contrast is much more important than being able to hear the ball. Um, also with balls that make noise, if you give everyone in your class one so that no one is different, the problem is that child, the child with vision impairment often can't tell which ball that's making noise is theirs. So bell balls are one of the, one, the few options where you don't want everyone using a, a bit of specialist equipment. Other balls that don't make noise but that can be very accessible are simply ones with good high contrast. So this volleyball with um, yellow and white and black can be a good option for a kid with low vision. Or you can modify this mainstream ball by taking gaffer tape and making stripes with maybe yellow and black or blue and white. And you need to talk to your student to work out what colors and what contrasts work best for them. But a lot of cases it can be very, something, very simple to modify an existing bit of equipment. Other things like $2 shop items, like this, um, are naturally inclusive because they're lightweight, they're easy to catch, and they're very high contrast. So while it's not mainstream sport equipment, um, doing training or doing practicing with balls like this can be very handy. One of the simplest ways to take a mainstream bit of equipment and modify it is by adding a, a beeper box. Now, they're not the most robust of boxes, and when you flick them on, they do emit a nice sound. All you do is you take a foam ball, Take a pair of scissors, create a hole, put in the beeper box, and you want to stuff it down fairly far so that when the child kicks or throws it, the beeper box doesn't contact the floor. Um, and you literally put it in, and you now have an audible ball. And it's very easy to take that out and use it as a mainstream bit of equipment still. There are balls that you can buy that are ready made. So this example of a ball has already got a split in it and it's got a vinyl cover, so it's a bit more robust. Um, and these can be purchased with the beeper um, online. Other mainstream bits of equipment include an audible rugby ball, and a football, which can be made accessible very easily by putting what looks like a boogie board leash on it. Um, these leashes are called footy mates, and there are also ones available for soccer balls. You take a mainstream ball in junior or senior size, you put it inside the harness, which the child can learn to do themselves. It's got an elasticized rope and a, a, least, a, a wrist leash. With these balls, you do want to make sure you're very clear about your rules with them. Uh, no helicoptering is a really good rule. Um, but these can be a great way to increase the amount of skill practice a child gets with a ball without having to chase it later on. Um, and you'll probably find that most kids are quite drawn to these, so I quite like these as bits of equipment. There are other versions of that, such as this soccer ball harness. Um, and this can be made yourself by getting a dog lead and an old basketball net or some, me uh, some mesh netting and a bit of retractable cord. And this allows the child to practice the skill over and over again without needing to go and chase the ball, which for a vision impaired child can take up most of their PE session. Another simple way to make a ball accessible for sport is literally to put a plastic bag around it. This makes it quite noisy when it's moving, and in some cases the child can still hear it in the air. Um, it also makes the ball in some cases easier to see, 
So it's a really easy way of doing accessibility in your mainstream classroom. With ball sports like tennis, which use a much smaller ball, that can be quite difficult for a child with low vision to see and to participate. So if you have a larger version of the same ball, like these two novelty balls, it can be a lot easier for them to see it and to still participate on an equal basis as their peers. Other types of modified versions of tennis equipment include a weighted base with a ball attached, and this can be used also for hockey or golf or any other implement sports where the child has to go and then chase the ball that they've hit. That may make them spend a lot of their PE time chasing as opposed to learning. So something as simple as this, or tying it to uh, a firm object, or sinking um, a bolt in the ground and tying a string onto the ball, they're really simple ways of just making that sport experience a lot more inclusive for your children with vision impairment. Other ways to make things very inclusive, make it bigger, make it brighter, so the same concept as using uh, the tennis balls. This is just a fleece foam cover and inside is a, um, a half deflated uh, balloon with some rice inside of it. Now for a young child this makes it a lot easier for them to catch and hold the ball um, and for, a for the young child with vision impairment it makes it even easier for them to see it. So for some kids who have multiple disabilities, making things easier to grasp means that they can participate more easily. So this is an excellent option. Under inflation can be a really simple way of making your equipment more accessible. Going with the same theme of high contrast and making things easier to catch and grasp, using a Velcro set of balls and mitts means that for a child with low vision they can probably see that bright ball better, especially if their peer has a dark top like what I'm wearing. Um, and having a a big area to which to throw, so a larger target area that's easy for them to see, can make tossing and catching a lot easier to learn. Um, even a totally blind child can learn to use these sorts of balls and equipment because for them, their classmate can simply make a noise on this pad to let them know where to throw, and with practice they can do the same thing. And because the blind child simply has to hold out the pad for their sighted classmate to throw to, they don't have to worry about catching it in a very small window of time they've got to actually physically grasp the ball. So these can be terrific. Um, I have seen other versions, like these grip mitts. Some kids really enjoy them, some kids don't find them that useful, but it just means they get to practice the hand grasp as well as having a ball that sticks to their palm. Continuing with the theme of eye-hand coordination, or in some cases ear-hand coordination, um, we have some balls here which can be purchased. I don't find the footy that useful, to be honest, um, although some kids really do enjoy being able to hear it really well. It is much smaller, but for doing things like kicking, it tends to collapse, and I would tend to recommend using a real footy with the harness as opposed to something like this. But it is an option. Small balls like this can be really handy to practice things like bowling, or uh, target throwing, or soccer, simply because it's a really clear sound, um, and for a child with low vision, they may be able to see an orange ball like this against a green grass background. Balls like this can be useful for teaching goalball, which is a blind Paralympic sport. They can be used for, te for teaching soccer um, and kicking skills to very young children. However, because of the way the ball is made, I wouldn't suggest kicking it at a very high velocity because the seam tends to split. Other belt balls can be made simply by modifying an existing ball. So this is just a cheap plastic uh, toy bowling ball and all that's been done is some uh, holes have been drilled into it and some uh, bits of washers and bells have been pushed into the holes. It's actually quite a nice sound and this could be useful for teaching underhand rolling. For kids with low vision, Having an extra long tail to visually track a ball in the air can be quite handy. Because it's a smaller ball, they can still practice the uh, overhand and underhand throws with it, but the tail may give them a bit more visual information about the ball whilst it's in the air. Not every kid will find this useful, but there are some who will. And you can certainly make your own by simply tying some colored fabric um, and either hot gluing it or sewing it onto a ball surface. With other types of balls for tossing and catching, one of the biggest problems for kids with low vision is that when you drop it, it rolls away, and so they end up spending a lot of time looking around for it. So an easy way to get around that is by having a ball that has natural breaks. So cush balls, the little plastic balls with all the legs, or spider balls, which have whoops, lots of longer legs, these are terrific because when you drop them, they don't actually roll away. And if you do do underhand rolling with them, they naturally break themselves. So the child doesn't end up spending half their PE time looking for their ball. 
Another benefit of a ball that has longer rubbery legs like this is that for a totally blind child to practice tossing and catching, they can actually feel the legs of the ball before it lands in their hand. And in some cases, if they toss it up and down their chest, they can actually feel how high they've thrown that ball because it doesn't really make a lot of noise. So balls like this can be terrific. I haven't really worked out how to make one for myself yet, but they can be purchased commercially. Other versions of that theme include pellet balls, which again don't roll away if you drop them and can be really nice and easy to catch with a hand, or yarn balls, which can be made. They do roll away a little bit, but they're also not very scary. So if you're doing tossing and catching activities with a child who's really frightened of the ball, using something soft like this can sort of take away that fear. Lastly, you can certainly make your own bell balls by buying wiffle balls, which are plastic balls that have holes already in them, and just pushing in bent washers, old coins, uh, bells from a you know, spotlight store, and you can make your own audible ball for rolling or tossing and catching. Lastly, the old-fashioned bean bag is quite a good one as well. It's easy to catch, you can make them very large, um, and they can be made for next to nothing. Another really good option for teaching kids to throw and catch is the use of juggling scarves, which can be made or bought commercially. What I like about these is that they're easy to catch. You don't actually have to get the whole ball in your hand to catch it. You can just happen just to get a little bit. They're very lightweight, so they drop very slowly, so it gives a child extra time to react to a scarf that's been thrown to them or that they're throwing themselves. They're very bright, and they also don't roll away. Uh, we've had great success in teaching kids who are totally blind to juggle using these scarves and to simply practice tossing and catching with a friend. Um, they can certainly be used for artistic and creative activities, but for simple tossing and catching, these can be really handy. Um, one of the things that we tend to teach is that unlike holding a ball and having your palm facing to the ceiling, we tend to teach kids to hold it so that the scarf hangs down and tossing it and grabbing it down. It can be tossed up and, grab and grabbed up as you move on to it, but some kids find that this is an easy way to start and then they move to a palm up. Other ways to practice tossing and catching are again to create a leash between a catching object and the ball. So this is just a bit of elastic cord. I've drilled a hole in it and tied it to the ball. It's a very simple way to give them extra practice time without having to spend time looking after a ball that's rolled away. Rubbish balls are also a terrific way to get kids throwing and catching. This is literally a plastic bag and some sticky tape. They're lightweight, they don't cost anything, and they don't hurt if they hit you. So if you do an activity like throwing and catching um, over a barrier, so it's something like not in my backyard, we have two teams of kids and they're throwing over top of um, a tennis net to see who can get the most balls on the other side. If this hits anyone in the head or the face, there's going to be no injuries whatsoever. They're really fun, they're really friendly, it's a novel activity, and it's a great way to encourage more participation um, by everyone. You can make them big and bright. You can take some yellow gaffer tape or some black and white gaffer tape and make them much more uh, visually accessible. But certainly for a blind child, if you make enough of them, there are always going to be some on the floor that they can find really quickly. So this can be a terrific way to go. With throwing and catching, having hand paddles like these can be a good way to start moving up towards a shorthanded implement like a tennis racket or a badminton racket. What's great about these sorts of hand ba bats is that they give a low vision child a bigger target to throw to. So for a low vision child, if their partner has one, they can see a much easier space to toss the ball to. And for a totally blind child, it gives their sighted partner a target at which to throw. Um, some kids prefer to wear one on each hand because they can actually start pa passing a ball between each hand. Um, and then they can start moving towards serving. And for blind children, being able to learn tennis-based skills is really important because there are tennis-like games that are uh, very accessible, such as swish or blind tennis, which is played extensively in Japan. These are boundaloon nets, which are a wire frame net with some elastic fabric in it. Again, it gives it a large visual target area for a low vision child to toss a ball to. And for a totally blind child, it gives their sighted partner a large target to toss it through. Using a lightweight ball or a balloon, it can be used really as a bit of a trampoline surface to toss and pass a ball between two people or between a, one person and a large group of people. Um, they're friendly, they're lightweight, they're very easy to use. You don't have to have great grip, grip strength to use them. And for a low vision child, the large white area can be usually very visually accessible. Or again, you can take some markers and color it in or take some tape um, to make it the right color for that child. Lastly, for practicing tossing and catching, the use of a catapult can be quite handy. Not all children will find this very useful because it can go too quickly for some children with low vision because they don't have enough time to visually track the ball. But you place the ball on the end, you stomp on the end, and it flies up and they catch it in their hands. 
Not recommended for all kids, but it may be worthwhile for some low vision kids to practice their tossing and catching. For blind tennis, um, a few extra bits of equipment are necessary, and it's really just a modified version of mainstream tennis. Um, there's totally blind tennis, where you use a small sponge ball that has a tiny ball on the inside that's got some metal pellets inside, so you can hear it in the air. Or you can play the big vol version, which is literally just tennis with a larger ball. Um, a larger ball can be a novelty ball like this, or it can be a small foam ball that's got higher contrast. Um, it really is up to the student. There's no real regulation size for a big ball tennis game. Uh, you can have a double bounce rule if that's helpful for your student. You can, you can really modify the rules however you see fit. Um, the main thing is participation, learning how to play the sport. So with big ball tennis, a lot of people choose to use a slightly larger racket because the ball spends more time close to the ground than higher up in the air um, as opposed to mainstream tennis. Having a slightly larger racket head size can be really handy for playing ground shots um, and also it gives them more surface area to try to contact the ball. The other simple modification is to make the net slightly more visually accessible. So we've just run some yellow gaffer tape along the top edge and we've added some bells to it so that the child can hear if their ball hits the net. Um, the other thing that you can use is some tactile tape. So this is sandpaper tape from uh, Bunnings and you can use this to run along the lines so that the student can feel the lines with their feet so they're not having to look down and check all the time where they are. Um, a note about this, because it's so rough, it will take off skin if the child um, skids on it. So you may want to think about when you would use a tape like this and when you wouldn't. Um, for young children who are learning to move across the gym, using gaffer tape with some string underneath of it or gaffer tape that's been wrinkled along the top edge can be a lot friendlier if you fall on it as opposed to sandpaper tape. Um, however, this is much more long lasting and tends not to leave gunk on your wooden floors. For other sports that are more disability specific, goalball can be a really excellent choice for kids with low vision or who are totally blind. Because in goalball, everyone wears an eye mask. It doesn't matter whether you've got a little bit of vision or extremely good vision or none at all. Everyone wears an eye mask. This is a regulation eye mask. It's made of flexible rubber, kind of looks like a ski mask, and it prevents anyone from seeing anything. You can buy these at great expense. You can uh, collect some old ski masks and use black tape to cover over them. Or you can simply use a combination of a sleep shade with a pair of swimming goggles over top of it to hold it in place. So a sleep mask like this, which can be purchased uh, or borrowed from Qantas, worn over the eyes, and then with a pair of swimming goggles on top. It may seem like a lot of overkill, but wearing a, sl a sleep mask like this with goggles over top helps prevent kids from peeking underneath, which from experience is what we usually find. So having these on over the top just tends to hold it in place a little bit better. Um, another very cheap option is simply to buy some black strips of fabric and tie them around your head, kind of like a bandana. Um, and they can be easily washed uh, for hygiene purposes. So the other bits of equipment you'll need for, uh, for goal wall are knee pads and elbow pads. Um, that's because a lot of the, f the game is played on the floor, so diving across the floor. Um, and then the last thing you need is a goal ball. This is a regulation goal ball, uh, which can be purchased online, but you can also use other bell balls to lead up to it. Goal balls can be quite heavy, um, so for younger children we'd recommend not using a regulation goal ball. We'd recommend using something a lot lighter, like one of the bell balls that I showed earlier. One of the tricky things for students with vision impairments in a PE setting is they're often not quite sure where they need to be or where their body needs to be in space to do different movements. So using things like floor markers can be a really quick and handy way to, know, to make sure that they know where they're supposed to be and in some cases where they need to move to. It can be as simple as using a hula hoop on the floor and having every child have their own hula hoop and they stand inside that hula hoop to do exercises or activities like tossing and catching to themselves or doing balances or jumping. This is a really simple way to set out a defined physical space for the child. Um, and if everyone has one, no one's different. So the hula hoop. So continuing on with uh, floor markers and ways for a child to know where they are, where they need to go, um, something like this half air filled dome can be a really handy way of practicing locomotor movements, uh, jumping, punching in some cases, and balancing. Um, what I like about these is that they come in a set of six. They are numbered with a nice high visibility number and braille label can also be applied so that a child who's totally blind can read the number. Uh, they do match the six braille dots, so if your child's a braille learner, they'll probably find this especially interesting and certainly their classmates as well. They can, be they can be used for practicing balancing, they can be used for practicing jumping, so jumping from one space to the next, for stepping over on a balance beam, for tossing and catching with a friend. We found all sorts of really creative ways to use these little air-filled domes. And because they make a sound, for a totally blind child, it's just that extra bit of feedback. Um, whereas for a sighted child, certainly they get the color and they get to watch it squishing, but for a blind child, that little bit of extra squish, that's quite fun. 
So for more novel physical activities that are naturally inclusive, um, one of the things that we've used a lot is this magic carpet or sled dog ride, which is just a piece of brightly colored fleece fabric, or a scooter board, which is a plastic board with caster wheels and handles, and a rope. And the way this activity works is that either using a wood floor or in some cases a carpeted floor for the scooter board, you have a child who either sits or lies in their stomach or kneels on either the soft mat or on the scooter board, and they hold on to the point where the rope folds. Then two of their friends hold on to either end and they literally pull them across the floor. You can do this with braces, you can have a relay, you can do lots of different ways to incorporate this into your physical education program. But what's really lovely is that for the child who's vision impaired, they might be sitting uh, on the mat the first go, and then they might be pulling their friends along the next go because you've got another sighted person that's helping with the uh, navigating. So the blind child's not having to rely on vision to get to, from one point to another. They're naturally included. It's a great amount of fun. It's good for core stability and upper body strength and teamwork and cooperation. So it's a really uh, favorite activity here, and we'd certainly recommend trying it. Um, also, with a heavier rope like this, these can be really useful for teaching rope skipping. A lot of times children with vision impairment have a really hard time learning how to rope skip because they can't see the rope dropping over their head, so it's a bit of an abstract concept that the rope spins around them. But when you use a really heavy weighted rope like this, they can actually feel it in the air more. Um, and also it's softer, so you don't get that lovely feel of the uh, rope snapping against your legs. So we found great success with using weighted ropes to teach rope skipping. Um, and certainly then moving up to a more lighter weight one, this one's missing a handle, um, but just to be able to feel the rope in the air would be a lot more beneficial. Speaking about other types of activities that are naturally inclusive, um, modifying existing sports like hockey can be really successful if you've got the right equipment. So these are polo hockey sticks, they come in two sizes, junior and senior, and they just have a large foam end, which is the end that you hit the ball with, and the idea is the same as uh, regular hockey, you dribble a ball down the court and you hit. Now for a totally blind child, all you need to use is a bell ball because these are nice and safe. They're not going to hurt if anyone gets hit in the shin with them. Um, they're easy to handle. They actually require less skill and they make it easier for that child to participate with their peers on an equal basis. So it's a simple idea of high vision and a bit of sound. That's really it. Another piece of really inclusive physical education equipment is of course the parachute. I've had great success with these um, as a punching bag to start the class off with. Everyone gets a bit of a go at punching or kicking the bag, which they all quite like. But then when you unfold it and everyone gets a place around it, what it means is that for the child with low vision, they now know where all their classmates are. They can do a quick roll call around the parachute and work out where everyone is. Because the parachute doesn't run away, it doesn't move that much, they can stay stationary and still participate just like everyone else. You can do running in a, in a circle with it, you can put a ball in the middle of it, you can put a child in the middle of it and have a bit of a shake uh, where the child sits on their bottom, everyone else shakes the parachute around them. There are literally hundreds of activities you can do with a parachute at primary and even secondary level. There are books written about them, so I won't probably go into all the different activities, but I will say that these are one of the most inclusive ways to get people active in a physical education setting. One of the lovely things about making phys ed inclusive is that while you know, it means that that child's enjoying that class and is becoming more physically active. The long-term benefits are much more powerful because unfortunately research shows that most kids with vision impairment have a lower level of fitness than their peers, are less physically active, and as adults they tend to have more associated health conditions. That's unacceptable. And so making things like phys ed and sport inclusive for these students lets them know that being physically active is fun, it's something that they can do with their peers, it's something that they can do outside of school so they can go and play a sport that is accessible to them, and they can enjoy that sense of a camaraderie that comes in a PE setting. Because we also know that a lot of our kids with vision impairment struggle socially, and what better place to be included socially than in phys ed when you're playing and, act and actively engaging with your peers. So while some of this equipment may be tricky to find, or you may think, oh, it's not that, it, it may not make that big of a difference, I can tell you it makes an enormous difference. Being able to do the same activity as your peers or as close as possible to it just because you can see the ball coming or you know where to jump or you know where to run to, those things make a huge difference. And hopefully with this video you might be able to understand some of the ways that you can make your phys ed setting a little bit more inclusive for our students. Thank you.